Hello, I'm Peter Vaughan, and today I'm at Spencer's Farm, a lovely little certificated site not far from Sudbury. There's a farm shop over there, orchards all around me, and it's very tranquil. And what have I got? I've got a big slice of French luxury. Had Marie Antoinette not had her head cut off, she and Louis XVI might have been travelling around in something like this, saying, well, let them travel in a voyageur rather than let them eat cake. Because this is Le Voyageur's latest model, the Heritage, or should I say, Heritage? Because it has got an accent on the E after all. Well, let's stick with Heritage. It's, and this one is the LVXH 8.7 CF. What does that all that mean? Well, the H bit in the LVX is uh, Heritage. LV is Le Voyageur, of course. Not sure about the X. 8.7 means this is 8.75 metres long. There's also a 7.9 version on a single rear axle rather than this one's tag axle. And CF is a central bed, so an island bed. You can also have either length of this heritage in twin bed form. So two questions that you'll want answering straight away, I expect. <clears throat> One, why is it called a heritage? Well, that's because it celebrates Le Voyageur's heritage. The company's been around since 1981, specialising in A-class motorhomes from the off. It's one of the very few brands that entered the market with an A-class, an A-class on a Mercedes. And today, it still only builds A-class motorhomes, but it hasn't built on the Merc chassis for a few years. And the heritage marks a return to Mercedes-Benz power for a Le Voyageur motorhome. So this is a five and a half ton chassis, an Alco chassis. So it's a front wheel drive Mercedes Sprinter. This one's got the 170 horsepower engine and the nine speed automatic gearbox. And what does it cost? Well, in theory, you could buy this Le Voyageur Heritage, this particular model from around 141,000 pounds. However, what you do need to factor in is the luxury pack which costs £34,800. On top of that, this one has a few little extras, things like carpets, an oven and a microwave, bringing the total up to just over £181,000. A lot of money, but comparable, I think, with many German-built rivals. And, of course, most of the rivals will come from Germany, from companies like Cotago and Heimer. What do you get for that? Well, you get a lot of motorhome. Let's start by having a look at some of the external features. But before we show you around some of the details, I will just explain why that luxury pack is so important. And I can't remember all the details off the top of my head because there's quite a few of them, as you'd expect for nearly 35 grand. So the luxury pack includes the 170 horsepower engine instead of 143, 17 inch alloy wheels, additional water-based heating, two extra keys, the Audi heating system rather than a Truma system, an Audi heat exchanger, the 10.25 inch MBUX multimedia system on the dashboard, 360 degree drone camera system, dynamic landscape format for 360 de degree camera and dash cam, smartphone wireless charger, lengthways electric drop down bed, 24 inch full HD TV screen in the lounge, ceramic bowl toilet, SOG toilet ventilation, second toilet cassette, clothes drying rack in the shower, electric waste water drain, duckboard in the shower, electric bed headboard, for the island bed, a 210 amp hour Super B lithium battery, an 1800 watt pure sine wave inverter, 230 volt electric cable reel, water hose reel, water filtration system, two 100 watt high performance solar panels, and then two more 100 watt solar panels. So there's four solar panels on the roof. A duo control remote control display, soporific gas alarm, 12 volt Thule electric awning, LED light on the awning, an 85 centimetre twin LMB automatic satellite dish, 
and dual speakers in the bedroom with amplifier. Whew. So, time to look at some details and, first of all, down the near side. And of course, this being a Continental A-Class, the main habitation door is over on the off side and you've got a single cab door on the near side. Both are operated with Merck's remote central locking. Then you've got bus type mirrors. Of course, on a motorhome of this size, you need those. The top lens is electrically adjusted, but the smaller convex lens below, you have to push that manually. Six alloy wheels, of course. These will fill her there. And then in here, in this large locker, well, first of all, you can see the folded travel seat, but more importantly, underneath here, right across the full width of the van is your double floor storage. That's 250 millimeters high. The next door gives you access for servicing of your Audi heating system, the wet radiator-based central heating. And then back here, this is a feature I particularly like because you've got a built-in hose for filling your fresh water. And of course, if you're attached on a, on a service pitch, you can just run the hose through a little trap door in the floor and be permanently attached to your water supply. Wastewater drainage, well, that's electrically operated via a switch on the dashboard and water tank capacities, they're 200 litres for fresh and 120 litres waste. And then, of course, we have the supersized garage. 1.08 metres wide, 1.04 metres high. Of course, across the full width of the motorhome, you've got tie-down points adjustable on rails, top and bottom. You've got this LED strip right the way across the garage, so when you've got fully loaded up, you should still be able to find all your, your gear. What else have you got? Well, over on the other side, you've then got a 12 volt socket and a 230 volt socket and an external shower as well. And then these cushions, well, you'll see those again later when I demonstrate the drop down bed in the cab. And in this box is a spare cassette toilet. I would have liked to have seen somewhere where that properly sort of clips into place, preferably in its own outside locker because you certainly won't want that sliding around when it's been used. But it is a useful backup for off-grid use because the first thing you're going to run out of is toilet capacity. So it's a substantial garage and, of course, there's plenty of storage on board. Plenty of payload too because before options, this van has 1,400 kilos of payload. Well, that's what you get with a five and a half ton chassis. Forward of the garage, you've then got this external locker that gives you a built-in mains lead on a reel, just like the fresh water hose. Another great idea. And again, it drops through a little trap door in the floor. Cassette servicing hatch. And then here, you've got access to all your vehicle electrics. At the front, your RCD, um, your caravan fuses, your habitation fuses, and then turn that door around and you've got access to even more of the vehicle's electrics. As I said, you get with the luxury pack, you get an 1800 watt inverter and a 210 amp hour lithium battery, a standard, a standard within the luxury pack. It can order a second lithium battery too, another 210 amps, if you really, really are serious about off-grid camping. Forward of that, again, you've got access in, you can see the second of the rear travel seats, and again, that full size, full width uh, access into your double floor. So lots and lots of storage right the way across the van. It might have been better to have a less shiny floor though, so things don't slide around. You might need to put something on top of that to keep them from moving while you travel. And then finally, at the front, your gas locker. The body construction is polyester on the outside, aluminium on the inside skin, and then 35 mil of insulation between the two. That's for the sidewalls and the roof. Front and rear panels are 
single mouldings of polyester and then the floor includes 27 millimetres of insulation. And now time to go on board. Of course this is your habitation door, a nice wide door on the off side with an electric step and a further step inside and the door opens around on a gas strut. Step inside, I've got the carpets down but there's a little area for you to take your shoes off which is rather neat. Not only that, but lift that section of floor and you can chuck your shoes out of the way. Now, what a lovely lounge area. Of course you've got the En Vogue twin side settees. It feels nice and open and spacious. Everything that you'd hope for in a motorhome costing £180,000 and best part of nine metres long. These captain's chairs are from SKA. They swivel, of course, very easily in this wide A-class cab. You've got the integrated seat belts. You've also got length adjustment on the squab cushions. So if you're very long in the leg, that's a plus. Um, they will just go round full 180 degrees so you can put your feet up on the sofa slightly easier on the passenger side with no steering wheel but both will go right the way around if you want them to and you raise them up when you're in uh, living mode if on site mode if you like because the cab floor is slightly lower there is this step it's not a big one it's just a little step between the cab and the uh, the lounge floor which is well i'm sure you get used to it but uh, I hope you won't trip over that. Of course, you've got the big A-class windscreen, lots of light in this lounge area, artificial and natural daylight. You've got the big wind-up sunroof over the lounge, lots of spotlights uh, in the ceiling, these strip lights under the, uh, the drop-down bed, more mood lights over the top lockers. All feels very swish. In fact, the lighting is programmable. Now, press Versailles mode, back to Marie Antoinette again, and you get all the lights on in the living area, right through lounge, kitchen, bedroom and bathroom. And then you can set different modes according to your preference. Each area you can dim the lights or have no lights on at all. So you might have just sombre mood lighting, nice and relaxed in the bedroom, bright lights in the lounge and maybe nothing at all in the kitchen. You can set, as I say, several different modes on the main control panel. Nice little touch. Obviously the priority of the French isn't huge TV screens that zoom up from behind the sofa as we've seen in some German vans, but 24 inch screen is perfectly adequate and it does hinge away from the wall so you can get a more comfortable angle of viewing. And it's a sensible height too, it's not right up in the sky. There's plenty of room to relax in this lounge. Five could be seated here very comfortably. On the walls, you've got dust mite proof, antibacterial lining, a sort of microfiber finish, and it's on the ceiling as well. It gives a, a nice, cozy atmosphere. It's, supposed to be acoustic benefit as well as uh, just a, a nice finish. And the leather is standard. You've got a choice of this, which is called Vision, this uh, beige color, or a gray, which is called Satin. And there's two choices of furniture too. This is called Dune, or there's a darker wood called Riviera. I think I'd rather prefer this look. Um, the gray might be rather cold and the dark furniture might uh, just close things in a little more. But there's not the level of choice that you get on some of the German vans. The table is pretty enormous, um, but it doesn't get in the way because it folds in half. Unfold it and you can have a banquet in here and it's not all floppy and wobbly as some of them are. So these settees are very comfortable. They're a good height off the floor. They've got nice shape to the backrest. It's a lounge that's been done very well. 
but when you want to uh, convert it to travel seats, the size and weight of these settee cushions is, uh, is a slight downside. You have to unclip the backrest from the wall first of all. And bear in mind, you're gonna have to store these while you travel. So, uh, on the near side particularly, the, the cushions are large and heavy, not quite so big on the other side of the van. And then we saw the travel seats tucked away when we were looking at the external storage, and they are the usual Agouti travel seats. That fold up from underneath. Now, they're not thickly padded like the sofas, so they're probably better for children than adults or short journeys rather than long ones. But it does mean that you can have the big comfy lounge and perhaps occasionally take your grandchildren with you. Before we move on to the kitchen, I should just mention the USB ports because there's two at this end of the near side sofa, two at the other end and two more down under the telly where, are they, where there are these useful little shelves as well. In the kitchen, you've only got one three pin socket, although there is a 12 volt socket above it as well. What you have got is a decent amount of worktop, especially with this sink cover in place. But even with that removed, well, it's more workspace than you get in a lot of vans. The sink too is nice and deep with a domestic size outlet and a nice high quality metal tap. I like this shelf area too for things like your coffee, your condiments, all that sort of thing. And you've got an extractor hood as well with a light and a clock. The actual hob though is just two rings, which seems a little disappointing in a van of this class. Perhaps the French don't do so much cooking inside their motorhomes. Perhaps they always go to the auberge. On the other side of the van, you have got a microwave, but it is rather high up. Bit of an afterthought perhaps for the UK market. It is an option, as is the oven, which is much better placed down low below the counter level. And that is the usual Thetford duplex combined oven and grill. What I really like about this kitchen though, is its storage, which is phenomenal. Behind these nice white high gloss doors up top, you've got big shelved lockers. No great surprise there, perhaps. The two main drawers in the kitchen are locked with a key centrally, and you've got a huge cutlery drawer, and then below that, a really big pull-out unit with room for eight bottles of vin rouge and a couple of waste bins for, well, recycling the empty bottles of beer, perhaps. Alongside that, you've got another pull-out with room for a spare four bottles of wine. Of course, your Vin Blanc will be over on the other side in this 153 litre Dometic fridge freezer. It's the two door type, so separate freezer compartment above and the doors open from either side. Not enough storage still? Well, there's more because there's this pull out pantry unit, nice upstands that don't, everything doesn't fall out when you open it. And another equally useful one down below. Another one over here as well. I can't remember the last time I saw a motorhome with such well-planned and practical kitchen storage. Beyond the kitchen, the toilet door does the usual thing of closing off the back end of the motorhome and you've then got sliding doors that close off the bedroom. Now, this washroom area actually accounts for 1.27 metres of the vehicle's overall length. And this is the main beneficiary of you going for the tag axle 8.7 models over the shorter 7.9 heritage vans. 
So in this space, well, on this side, on the off side, you've got the toilet area, storage in there behind mirrored cupboards, but the loo, although it's a ceramic bowl loo, it is rather high. You'll need very long legs to be comfortable when sitting on the throne. However, if you are a royal, you don't have to be one that's been guillotined to fit in the shower. You do step up into it, so headroom is slightly reduced over the rest of the living area, but it's 1.84 metres or so minimum in there, slightly more if your head is actually in the sort of domed roof vent area, in fact, quite a bit more in there. You've got a useful shelf for your shower, gel, shampoo and all that sort of stuff. A clothes drying rack pulls out as well. Nice central drain, so hopefully all the water should gravitate towards that. Then alongside, well, you've got the sort of designer bowl on a plinth, but more importantly, you've got a nice, again, Argo metal tap, and it's black to fit in with the rest of the decor. Above that, you've got the sort of Hollywood style backlit mirror, and behind that, nice practical storage with upstands to keep everything in place. So you haven't got that, open the door when you arrive on site and everything tumbles out on top of you. Over on the other side, well, this is more than just a bathroom. It's a proper changing room because as well as the wardrobes on either side of the island bed in the usual style, you've got more wardrobe space here, top and bottom. In either case, you've got a shelf at mid height that you can remove if you want to. So you can have hanging rails top and bottom or shelves top and bottom or mix and match. You can even remove the central shelf and have hanging height from top to bottom. So if you want to take your ball gowns on holiday, well, if you are a royal princess, perhaps ideal. Just two more things to note before we move on to the rear bedroom. First of all, the Truma Aventa Habitation Air Conditioning. Well, that is a £2,450 option. And then you might have spotted, if you're particularly eagle-eyed, this little switch between the upper and lower wardrobes. Well, let's press that and see what happens. Now that's what I call a bedroom fit for a king. In this chaise long position, well, there's no worries now about sitting up in bed. It is so comfy, you might decide to stay here all day. You can have a second TV at the foot of the bed. There's aerial sockets and uh, 12 volt there as well. You've got speakers built in under the top cupboards as well as these reading lights. You've got USBs on either side with these super generous bedside tables. The bed when it's down is 1.96 metres by 1.43 metres which is 6 foot 5 by 4 foot 8 and it's a nice place to be. Good lighting, this mood lighting around the top again this microfiber ceiling and some lovely details like these padded sections on the sides so it's not just a cupboard but somewhere where you could sit to take your socks off before you get into bed. Only downside is that when these doors are shut at the foot of the bed and the bed is in its down sleeping position well it's a bit of a tight squeeze through here. Of course this is a four berth motorhome so not only have you got the permanent bedroom at the back but you've got this drop down bed in the cab as well. But before we bring that into play, we need some privacy. So first of all, we have to drop the cab seats forward so they're nice and flat and out of the way. And then it's just a button up here next to the control panel. Although we do have to make sure that the uh, bed is unlocked so that it can come down. So now you have the typical A-class bed, 1.85 metres long by 1.35 metres wide. That's six foot one by four foot five. Perfectly adequate for a couple of kids because they won't mind climbing over each other and they won't need the loo in the night, hopefully. But if it's for adult usage, well, 
then you can extend the bed, pull this part of, add these su support straps, on. and then this is where those cushions that you saw in the garage come into play. Slot the extra cushions into place. And now you can use a ladder to get into bed, but if you're reasonably athletic, you won't need to. Pop via the settees. And up here, you now have a lengthways double bed, 1.98 metres long by 1.85 metres wide. Six foot six by six foot one. That is a good size bed. This roof vent above is essential, but it is an option. You've got a light on either side, more USBs and a useful little shelf for your reading matter, for your phone and so on. You won't find a bigger bed than this. So to the Mercedes bit, and well, you've got the 10 and a quarter inch MBUX display as part of the luxury pack. And of course that includes your sat nav, your Bluetooth, your radio and so on. You've also got the usual Mercedes features, the paddles to change gear on the automatic gearbox, keyless starting, lack of a gear stick, for, for want of a better word. This is your, your gear stick, it looks like the indicator stop, but uh, that does park and reverse and so on. Leather steering wheel, it all feels very nice. And the, the Mercedes dashboard has been better integrated into the larger A-Class environment than we often see. I do like these black units around. It feels more automotive. Often you get sort of wooden cabinets alongside the driver in a right-hand drive A-Class. And I don't know, mixing wood and plastic doesn't seem quite right somehow. So this does give a nice environment. But the star feature, in fact, one of the star features of the motorhome is this display here. You've got a reversing camera on the MBUX display, but you've also got this drone view. Now, this gives you like a fisheye lens, really close up at the back of the motorhome, but on the left-hand side, you've got a drone view, which is really useful, particularly when maneuvering back into a, into a pitch on a campsite, for example. Now, if you turn on the indicators, so you're maneuvering, that right-hand image changes again, and now you can see, particularly down that side of the vehicle, change to a left-hand indicator, and it shows you down the left-hand side of the vehicle. Brilliant for maneuvering such a large motorhome. Now, let's take her out on the road. <laughs> So what's it like to drive this big Franco-German beast? Well, performance seems pretty adequate, um, certainly comparable with the top 180 horsepower Fiat engine. Um, maybe even it might have the edge, um, but we're only on a short test drive and we're unladen, so probably a little bit unfair to comment. But certainly it goes quite well. It did surprise me for a minute. I thought, gosh, I'm not going that fast, am I? And then I realised we've got, for some strange reason, a kilometre an hour speedo. Other than that, conversion noise, yeah, there's a little bit, um, but only on the roughest of roads. Most of the time, it's absolutely fine. Engine noise, again, is pretty well subdued, um, apart from when it's working hard, say, up a steep hill and you're accelerating hard. But yeah, generally, noise levels are good. Visibility is good, especially forward. You've, you've got good, good vision at the front where some A-classes are quite daunting to position the front of the vehicle. Mirrors, the cameras, all give you good visibility. The only thing that I can fault is this. The windscreen wipers are set up for left-hand drive. Well, they do a pretty good job for the passenger Look at the amount of unswept area on the right-hand side. Please, the Voyager, can we have right-hand drive windscreen wipers on a right-hand drive vehicle? Other than that, of course, the Mercedes nine-speed automatic gearbox is super smooth. 
Um, and I especially like the way when you're slowing down, it changes down through the gears before you come to a halt. So yeah, if you want a motorhome as big as this, then this drives as well as any of them. Those six wheels give it nice stability. And were we out on the motorway, I'm sure that would be uh, very obvious. So my final verdict on this Le Voyager LVX H 8.7 CF. Can it be worth 180 grand? Well, yeah, if you've got that sort of money to spend on a motorhome of this size, then I reckon actually, compared with the Germans, it's probably pretty good value. By the time you've considered all the extra features of that luxury pack, things like the satellite dish, the four solar panels, the inverter, the lithium battery, yeah, it's probably not bad value these days. And it does feel a bit different to the Germans. It's got a bit of je ne sais quoi. Um, and that, I think, is probably the deciding factor. If you walk into this Le Voyageur and think, oh yeah, this is nice, this is different, then maybe this is for you. What don't I like? Well, I'm not keen on that little step between the cab and the living area, and I would like the wipers to go the correct way round, but apart from that, there's not much that I don't like. The storage is phenomenal. The bedroom is brilliant, as long as you can live with the tightness around the end of the bed when the sliding doors are shut, but if there's only two of you on board, then you probably wouldn't ever shut those anyway. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good van of this size. So, thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed our latest motorhome review. Of course, there are plenty more coming along, so don't forget to like and to subscribe to the channel. Thank you.